If you happen across something that looks like this the next time you're cleaning out the attic, don't put it in the garage sale. It might be a piece of Fulker or Stangle pottery created by a dynasty of potters stretching back to the mid-19th century. New Jersey has a long history as a center for art pottery, and pieces of Fulker and Stangle have become hot collectibles these days. So I got two of the, two of the little birds, matched pair, sit side by side. But when the bird was put on, it wasn't put on on an angle like this, it was put on straight. I didn't see one like that before. I never did either. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very pretty. Oh, look at that. That's too bad. Well, this is a a vinegar crock made by the Fulper Pottery Company, turn of the century. Um, it held, as you can see, cases, pure cider vinegar. They're the, the company that would have commissioned the making of the actual piece, and, and this would be the company, uh, the, the grocery store probably in Lakewood, New Jersey, that sold it. Yesterday, a man came. He said he, he paid $300 for a beer plate, and, and he asked me to try it. I said, well, <laughs> It probably was sold for three or four dollars in the beginning. <laughs> but since it was a good one, nowadays it is worth it. A Fulper or Stangle pot that's one of a kind and still in good condition can sell for hundreds of dollars. This is part of Fulper's handmade line from 1934. <coughs> the whole thing is hand thrown on a potter's wheel, and then each of the flowers was hand formed and then applied, and then it would be glazed. It came in three colors, green, blue, and a, a matte white. In the 19th century, most pottery was strictly utilitarian. That's what Abraham Fulper was making at the small factory he bought in Flemington in 1860. But by the turn of the century, his son William, nicknamed Dutch, had taken over, and he had bigger ideas. Dutch Fulper believed he had rediscovered a lost ancient Chinese glaze, and he expanded the Fulper line into art pottery. To help with this risky venture, he hired a 22-year-old ceramic chemist and engineer named Johann Martin Stangl. Stangl's task was to come up with new shapes and new forms and new glazes, mirror, matte, crystalline, monochromatic, flambe, and luster. The new enterprise was a success, and in 1916, Dutch Fulker was named a Master Craftsman by the Society of Arts and Crafts in Boston. Dutch Fulker was also a shrewd businessman who knew how to adapt to changing times. When World War I broke out and patriotic Americans began boycotting European porcelain, Fulker saw an opportunity. Doll heads. Fulper led the domestic porcelain business until the end of the war when the Europeans came flooding back into the market. Fulper changed course again, introducing a cheaper line of earthenware called Fulper Faience, designed by Martin Stangle. But he was struggling to stay afloat. Well, the pottery was having a hard time, and of course Mr. Fulper was president, and uh, he didn't know what he was going to do because the pottery was just going downhill. And Daddy went to him and said, if you make me president, I'll bring it out of the hole. And that was when he started the Stangle Pottery. And that was a less expensive ware, and it sold, which helped to, to build the business up again. Dutch Fulper died in 1928, and Martin Stangle took over. But the following year, the factory was totally destroyed in a devastating fire. The night of the fire, we got a telephone call like 2 o'clock that the pottery was burning and Daddy wasn't home. He was on a trip to Boston on a train, so there was no way they could let him know. And when he got to uh, Boston, the people in the hotel were saying, said to him, gee, we're sorry about the pottery burning down. He thought they were kidding. He laughed and said, yeah, isn't it too bad? Then he found out it was real and it burned to the ground. But Martin Stangle was not destroyed. He bought out what remained a Fulper share of the company and started turning out a different kind of pottery with his own Stangle trademark. There was a good deal of interest in Americana when I started there in the early 40s. And Mr. Stangle, being a businessman, was very aware of the fact that Americans were more interested in their own country. So he took me to the museum in Philadelphia to see the Pennsylvania Dutch things. 
and I made a number of sketches there and saw what they had done. I came from upstate New York and it was new to me. But we brought out a tulip pattern and some single bird patterns, distal finks and so forth. Kay Hackett was the designer of Stangle's most popular dinnerware, clay-based, hand-painted, and hand-carved. Then the carver would have an automatic pencil, like a lead pencil, but we put phonograph needles in them. Mm -hmm. And then we'd grind them off on the floor to make them rather blunt. The design is from cutting through one color clay to another is graffito, probably Italian. Stangle used two different techniques for his dinnerware. Hollow pieces were slip cast. Plates, cups, and bowls were jiggered. There's a mold, which is this shape but upside down, mm -hmm. so that soft clay from the pug mill is brought out. And the helper puts it on another mold. An arm comes down with a large platter-shaped thing and squashes it down to about a less than a half inch thick. And we were talking about the movement of wear from one department to another, and this was a great deal of this was done by men carrying the wear on boards on their head. And they wore a padded cap which was flat on the top, and I was told it was full of ladies' stockings rolled up to make it soft. By the 1950s, Stangle pottery was at its peak, merging modern equipment with traditional craftsmanship. When you had the Stangle pottery, even though things were being mass-produced, uh, there was still a human quality about them. They were all being um, decorated by hand still, and so each piece, even though it was mass-produced, there was something still a little bit different about each one. It's a little unusual in that the cobalt glaze turned out far lighter than the standard cobalt glaze. It was routinely a very, very dark blue, and yet this one is, is quite light, and so very unusual, very highly collectible. 70 I have over here, I need 80. Any further interest, I have 70 dollars. Once, twice. 